Um, thanks, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, tell you about the researcher's perspective on uh, persistent what? Uh, persistent identifiers. Um, until a year ago, I was the researcher member on the ORCID board of directors. Um, that was a very steep learning curve for a researcher. Um, and about a year and a half ago, I gave a talk about what I had learned as an ORCID board member. And uh, Alice Meadows, who's one of the organizers of uh, Peter Palooza, uh, was uh, present at that presentation. And so she asked me to revamp the presentation and, and talk to you today about what we as researchers actually um, uh, f uh, feel about the use of uh, persistent identifiers and how it helps, how they help us or how they don't help us in our daily life. I'm going to take you on a journey, uh, in essence, take you along on my journey through the, the, the wonderful world of persistent identifiers. Uh, but before I do so, I would like you to um, fill in a poll because I don't know who I'm talking to. And uh, so I'd like to know what my audience is. So if you could fill in the poll that's going to go live now, um, I'll take, you, I'll, I'll take a few minutes. So if you could uh, set up the poll, Melroy, I cannot, cannot see it here on my screen. Uh, take a minute or, or two to, uh, to click on, on your background. The poll uh, is while, live. Thank you. While I do that, while you're uh, getting your act together, I'd like to uh, follow in a, an established tradition here in Australia and acknowledge the uh, uh, traditional owners and custodians of the lands I'm currently speaking from. These are the uh, Wangal people of the Eora Nation. I'm in Rhodes, Western, uh, inner west of Sydney. And I uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present. How are the results, Mel Melroy? Are we getting enough people participating? Uh, so you've got uh, five people from pit providers. Uh, you've got uh, one from uh, it's changing. Yes, we are having a fair few of them actually answer. So there, is, there are people from the library, pit providers, platform providers, publishers, repositories, research institutions, and there are a few others. I'm not sure what that is, but... Right, sure. No, we didn't know either. That's why we put it there. Uh, <laughs> um, right, so uh, thank you for uh, putting up the poll. Unfortunately, I can't see it here on my screen, but uh, we'll, we'll look at it afterwards. Um, so most of you are not researchers, and uh, throughout the day today, we've seen a number of wonderful initiatives um, advertising what one, one can do with, uh, with PIDs, and uh, I'm actually quite excited about all this, and I'm going to use them more in the future, I think. But um, from a researcher's perspective, it hasn't always been that clear as to what PIDs can really be used for. So let me take you back a decade and start from my own, my own journey at the time in 2010, I was based at the University of Sheffield in the UK. That's that uh, uh, red area, Yorkshire, South Yorkshire in the UK. And in 2010, I moved to a senior position at Peking University. And uh, so I went from the UK to China. Now, I, was a, I, was, I knew what to expect to some extent, but in China, I really realized that most people have similar, similar names. And so, as we will see in just a moment, uh, the large majority of people in China are called Li, Chen, Zhang, Wang, Ma, etc. And there's a lot of them with the same surname. And, and, and those Western or English transliterations of their names are not necessarily associated with the same character. So you can see the problem that we have here immediately. Which Li are we talking about? Which, which Chen, which Jiang, etc. Now, when I moved from the UK to China, I was aware vaguely aware of a number of PIDs. Uh, the, the Scopus ID uh, was something that I had actually uh, been working with for a little while, and DOIs have been around for a bit longer. And so I knew about those things, but I didn't really think about them too much because they didn't have too much use other than DOI being useful to, to find papers, right? So in China, we had 1.4 billion people. About half of them, more than half of them, have only 20 surnames. And so you can see the problem there. If you want to identify someone who has the same surname and also the, the first names or the, 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 family, the other name, the, um, you know, the, the calling name, they tend to be fairly similar. So we needed a way to actually identify the individual researchers in China uh, because of the name uh, ambiguities. And so um, here you can see most of those people, uh, these, these are density maps, dark blue is highest density, and most of them are actually lo uh, are located around those red um, uh, locations in the north Beijing and towards the uh, southeastern coast Shanghai and, and 
a lot of people with the same same surname live in those cities where also most of the research institutions are located. Now, I spent about 12 years as a scientific editor, followed by a deputy editor in chief of two of the main journals in, in my field of astrophysics, the Astrophysical Journal, followed by the Astrophysical Journal Letters. And as scientific editor, one of the things I did, other than uh, assessing the quality of papers, is find potential reviewers for those papers. Being based in China, clearly there was an opportunity here to engage more of my Chinese colleagues. But if everyone being called Chen or Li or Zhang, I didn't know necessarily who to approach to review those papers. So name disambiguation became a major issue in my life. And so around 2013, um, I learned about the existence of ORCID, and uh, I, I saw that ORCID had established, had established an ambassador network. These were volunteers based uh, all around the world, and their idea was to push the idea of ORCID to local research organizations, libraries, um, um, all kinds of small organizations. And so I applied to become the China representative because there was no one in China at the time doing so. And that was irrespective of the fact that my Chinese was fairly rudimental. And so this was an issue, of course. Um, I did this for a number of years and I found it very difficult because in China, the idea was, well, we don't want to give our data away to repositories that are based somewhere overseas. We want to do it in-house. Now, an ORCID like um, a repository inside of China is useful for the domestic market, but it doesn't work internationally. And so there was this tension going on. Um, and so I, I continue, continued to promote the idea of disambiguation and I pr continued to promote ORCID. By now, that ambassador network no longer exists. Uh, we now, or ORCID now has a number of uh, paid staff members at uh, key locations all around the world. And so they, they and that's another, another thing, because as a volunteer, I was not necessarily taken seriously. As a salaried staff member, you are taken more seriously. And so here's... This is the type of thing that I showed my contacts in China. All right. Not, this is, of course, a Greek, a Greek name, but there are many people with the same surname, but having different ORCID IDs can disambiguate them. Uh, and you know that, of course, being all part of the Pida Palooza uh, meeting this time. So in 2017, I joined the ORCID board of directors, uh, directors as a researcher member. And this is great fun, but um, it also was a jump into the deep and I learned a lot of things I've never heard of. I've been interested in publications and publishing for a long time as an editor of a journal, but really the first two or three meetings of the ORCID board of directors went way over my head. And I tried to contribute and I'm very pleased to say that uh, I actually argued very strongly that um, as a single researcher member on the board, I could only represent, in essence, the physical and natural sciences, be being an astronomer by training, and I had no idea what uh, was happening in the humanities and social sciences. So, to my delight, uh, Orchid, the Orchid Board of Directors uh, agreed to add a second researcher to the team uh, in the field of humanities and social sciences, and that, that's been a great success, I believe. So, until the end of 2019, I was a researcher member on the board. I learned a lot. I really enjoyed being part of the project. I thought it was a real cool project, but really, I was wondering, why should I care as a researcher? It was great being part of the family and great being part of this initiative, but as a researcher, I didn't, didn't see any benefits at that point, even as a board member. If you're interested in my journey, the uh, URL of, uh, of a blog I wrote towards the end of my tenure is uh, available at the bottom of that page. Now, that's my involvement with PIDs. Um, in essence, about nine years or so. Uh, I've got a second poll here that uh, I'm asking Melroy to put up now. Can you please tell me how long you've been involved with PIDs? The poll is up. Thank you. We're not at the end of the story yet, but at this point I'd like to know, you know, how unique am I being, having been involved for a long time but not very deeply, and uh, how many of you have just started? Melroy, any results? Yes, uh, so far it's 44% is between two and five years, 27% uh, more than 10 years. Wow. And yeah, it is fluctuating a fair bit though. I've, I've seen a, a number of names of very senior ORCID board members uh, with whom I shared uh, board membership for a while. So I'm sure that th those people have been active for more than 10 years and uh, 
Yeah, so they, they know a lot better than me, of course, how things are, are working. Yeah. So right now it's stopped. It seems to have stabilized and it's, yeah, just when I say that, it has to move, doesn't it? That's okay. Uh, I think that's fine. Okay. That's, yes, go ahead. So uh, you've only got about 15% who've been involved with PITS for two years. Uh, and then between two and five, five and 10, and more than 10 years, it's about 30, 25, and 25. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much, everyone. So, okay. So I told you how I got into this and how orchids um, became a part of my life. And it was, a, was great fun and uh, an enormous learning curve that, that I, I think was fantastic. But how useful was orchid really for me? Now, in uh, 2018, almost three years ago, I moved to Macquarie University from Peking University. And as part of the onboarding, this is an actual screen from the onboarding, it said, welcome to Macquarie University. Now link, link your orchid to us. The first thing, pretty much the first thing that they asked me to do is link your orchid to us so that we get credit for all your publications and we go up in the rankings. Of course, that's what it is all about. And oh, by the way, don't forget to also link us to your Scopus ID, but that was apparently not that important. So orchid became important. A day or two after I joined Macquarie, I checked my orchid and look at that. The first employment item is that I was at Macquarie University and this was added by the university. So they really care about this. And so I started to think, oh, maybe my, uh, my activities within Orchid have been useful to some extent. Um, it's linked to my Scopus output and my Orchid output. You can see that here. This is from um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my publication records here. As a senior academic, this is kind of what you expect. It's going down a bit because I'm now an associate dean. And so that means I do a lot of admin, faculty admin, uh, rather than research. But uh, of course, the last data point is for this year, but just not, no publications yet. But again, ORCID is linked there and the university is linked there as well. They really insisted on getting that done quickly because it normally takes a long time to change affiliations. Um, we use the uh, pure research management, management system. This is uh, my page, uh, it's a bit outdated now, but anyway. Um, and again, ORCID features very prominently on there. So that seems to be the trend. And um, you know, it's all, as I said, about improving university rankings. Uh, fortunately, uh, my uh, my dean tells me that he's happy with my research profile, but I have to keep working on that. This is the public facing page. Uh, and again, ORCID features very uh, prominently there. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what external visitors to the website see. Now, of course, many of you know how these research management systems work. You can add your publications. This is from a recent uh, screen grab um, of, of some of my publications, and they're all linked. Um, uh, the, the, they've all been imported through through ORCID. Uh, I maintain my ORCID records. I can use uh, Pure to actually import new publications from ORCID and occasionally I get a flag saying, hey, there's another publication. Can you please check that it's yours? So that's helpful. I don't have to actually add anything manually. I did it maybe for uh, up to a handful of articles when I first uh, um, uh, initiated the, the Pure record. But, um, but it's now almost automatic. So that, that actually saves me time. Now, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, we published, one of my former students published an article in Nature Astronomy. We're very happy. You may have seen uh, a number of press releases about that. We called this, uh, our Milky Way galaxy is warped and twisted. And that was of course picked up by a lot of the uh, normal media, uh, including uh, unlikely uh, science newspapers like The Sun in the UK, which called us space boffins and said that we were going to look at what this meant for humanity. That's not true, but anyway. But Look at the name. Look at the names there of the authors. Uh, other than that, are all Chinese and, and me not being Chinese. What you see there is I've got some affiliations there, but no Orchid ID. And clearly, I've been, uh, you know, on Orchid for quite a long time. And so I was quite miffed and, and very unhappy that this, this had not been in, included. And the first author I just forgotten. Now, fortunately, um, it did show. The paper did show up in my Orchid records, and it came through Crossref. So fortunately, it's good that it's all linked because ORCID actually sh this showed up in ORCID and that way it got um, imported into Pure. So, phew, at least I got credit for that paper and we got a lot of press out of this as well. Great fun. Um, and there it shows up, it's the top paper there in that list, which I could add. Sorry, that's, I forgot that. Now, at the moment, as I said, I'm an associate dean at Macquarie University. My uh, portfolio is international. 
And now you start smirking probably because international is a bit of a problem at the moment, particularly here in Australia, where the international borders have been closed since March and there is no real prospect of them opening until the, the second half or even later this year. Nevertheless, we have, for instance, a, tra a staff travel scheme of which I'm, I'm the chair of the committee in, in my role as associate dean. And you can see one, uh, one of the items of eligibility is that you have to have an update, up to date ORCID and you have to link your work to ORCID. So the university really places a lot of uh, emphasis on having uh, an up to date ORCID record. So that was. Until about two years ago, uh, ORCID became a bit more useful, but still I was like, yeah, it's useful, but perhaps I can do it in a different way as well. Now, as you probably know, as a researcher, I need to apply for research funding. There's a lot of uh, funding organizations out there, of course, but uh, one of the key organizations that we use here in Australia is the Australian Research Council. As it happens, uh, at the moment, is it's, it's uh, application time, and I'm... Uh, I'm on leave this week, but uh, next week I'll go back to an application and make some changes that have been suggested by the university. But in any case, since two years ago now, or only, yeah, since two years ago, we can now enter our bibliography very easily through ORCID. This is the bibliography page at, uh, of one of the applications of the Australian Research Council. And it says there on the left-hand side, you can see populate from ORCID. Now, this has been possible from 2019, and this was, wow, I can save a lot of time by importing my bibliography directly. Now, it wasn't so easy in 2019, to be honest, because um, ORCID had like triplicates papers in there, and it took a lot of time to weed it all out. This year was a lot easier, so I was actually very pleased about that. So from it, it seems to be working. And so ORCID is starting to be very useful for me at this point, and I'm very pleased about that. Having said that, um, my current application I'm working on with one of my colleagues from within my department, and she's all fine, and she's done her bibliography herself, and an external collaborator from Europe. And if you've ever collaborated with um, Australian scientists on uh, Australian Research Council grants, you know that anyone and everyone needs to provide a lot of information about their background or CV, CV in, a, in a very specific pre-formatted uh, uh, format, and they have to enter their publications, up to 100 of them. Now, my external collaborator from Italy does have an ORCID. Great. Not really, it's empty. There's nothing in it. And he was busy, he didn't know what to do. So I said, you know what? I will um, give me your username and password. I fill in all of the details that I do need to fill in, and then you just approve it. Now, not having the ORCID populated was a problem because it didn't import any of his papers. And he had to import his 10 best publications from uh, throughout his career, as well as up to 90 other publications to fill out the list. But then I realized ORCID allows you to add data, your publications by DOI. Now, in astronomy and, astro and astrophysics, um, we don't use uh, any, well, we don't use general uh, repositories so much. We use the NASA Astrophysics Data System, which pretty much contains every single astronomy paper that we have ever published since the mid 1800s. So it's a great resource and we all use it. And every single paper in there contains a DOI, at least from a certain date onwards. We had a good presentation earlier today about historic papers and the need for for DOIs there, and I'm very pleased to see that that's actually happening now as well. So I said to Giuseppe, well, you know, I'm actually doing some astronomical observations tonight, and we have um, uh, observations that run for an hour and a half straight, and then another hour and a half straight, so I have some time. And so I went to his publication list from the NASA ADS, Astrophysics Data System. I copied the DOIs and added them manually to that bottom, add DOI, and within about half an hour, I had added his 90 publications. So it only took me half an hour to do things from scratch. Great. So these persistent identifiers are starting to become really helpful. And that's my conclusion as well. PIDs, particularly DOIs and certainly ORCID, have now reached a stage where they're getting useful to me in my professional life. It has taken a while, but I'm hooked and I'd like to do a lot more with them. And I've seen a lot of fantastic initiatives over the last day when, uh, when I've been following the, the conference. So that's all I have to say. That's my experience as a researcher. 
Uh, I'm perhaps not uh, your typical researcher because I'm more interested in these, these bits than some of my colleagues, but at least you've got an idea of what researchers go through. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. And I see some questions on the side. Yes, thank you very much for that, Richard. Uh, one of the questions that uh, we've had uh, Melissa ask is uh, when you say uh, Crossref put your publication into your ORCID record, did you, have you given, cross? I mean, how did that happen? Was there uh, something that you did or uh, when you initially set up your ORCID record, did you have to go through Crossref to populate, pre-populate some of it or? Yeah, this is a this is a great uh, great question, and I should have mentioned that. And certainly, I should have mentioned that as a former board member of Orchid, of course. Um, Orchid only um, does what you tell it to do. Uh, you have full control over uh, the content, and also full control over what is being made public. So, um, when you first when I first started when I first set up my Orchid and wanted to import all of my papers, I had to give permission to uh, a number of different repositories and other organizations to have access to my, to my ORCID records. Um, and so, yes, I had to give permission to Crossref to populate my, my ORCID. Cool. So I'm assuming that uh, as and when Crossref uh, minted a DOI for that particular paper, it would have recognized your name via email address. Exactly. On the as an authorship, and it would have then made that connection and put it into your ORCID record. And that made my life easy, right? Because I didn't have to yeah. do it myself. Fair enough. Cool. Ah, oh, Melissa. That wasn't her question. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Carolyn. Yes, I know. Uh, okay, so. Right. Uh, what is your question then, Melissa? Oh, there's an ask a question. Any other problems as a researcher that you'd like bits to address? So as I, as I said, my, my journey has been one of um, reluctant interest, I would say. Um, I, I could see the use of these of all these bits, ORCID, DOI, Scopus, all these things. But it's taken a long time for it to become really useful to me. And I am open to this, clearly having been active as an editor, et cetera, and, and I do, uh, I continue to do uh, quite a lot of, of in, in that area. Um, I, I think um, there is a disconnect uh, between uh, bid providers and, uh, and researchers. And that's also a matter of interest. Researchers are not always interested in, in this. So I think you have to have a killer application. You, every, Every PID provider that wants researchers to use them has to have a killer application to actually get the interest of the researcher. But once researchers see the use of the uh, of, of of the application, I think uh, it'll take off. Cool. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Uh, just a couple of more questions. Firstly, uh, Alejandro asks if changing the first name to given name and last name to family name in Orchid make its use in China easy. Mm. Um, look, um, um, Chinese researchers who publish internationally um, are using ORCIDs more and more, um, simply because many many journals require um, ORCIDs for submission. Uh, so that's just a fact of life. Um, yes, in China, the first and last names are reversed, but Chinese researchers who publish internationally don't see that as a major problem. They just do the right thing. So I don't think that that would make any difference. The, the main issue is one of, is, is perhaps cultural or perhaps even political in the sense that uh, um, Chinese authorities are uh, reluctant to allow this type of data to leave the country en masse. Fair enough. I hope that answers your question, Alejandro. And uh, one more question. It, uh, it says, hi, Richard. So it sounds like you needed to discover the value of PIDs by battling through the process yourself. However, is there anything that research support staff such as librarians can do to encourage the uptake of, for example, ORCIDs? Yes, and that's being done at my university. As I said, they're very keen to uh, that, that you use ORCID and they actually run the library 
runs uh, information sessions and they help researchers getting getting started. And that's because the use of ORCID is mandated to get benefits like those travel grants I talked about. Right? So if there is a stick here, you can have a carrot and a stick approach, right? If there's a stick here, researchers will do it. And if the university then or the institution provides uh, support, um, that will that will be helpful. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Richard. And on behalf of our audience, Thank <laughs> you.